Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno and welcome back to my C++ series. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about classes in C++. So we're finally getting into something called object-oriented programming, which is a very popular way of programming. Object-oriented programming is really just a style that you can adopt as to how you write your code. Other languages such as C-sharp and Java are primarily object-oriented languages. In fact, you can't really write any other type of code. I mean, you can if you really, really try, but ultimately those languages are meant to be object-oriented languages. However, C++ is something a little bit different because it doesn't really enforce a certain style upon you. The language C, for example, doesn't actually support object-oriented programming because in order to have object-oriented programming, you need to be able to have concepts such as classes and objects. And that's not something that's available in C. However, C++ does add all of that functionality if you wish to use it, and it is almost always a good idea to use it to some extent, so we're gonna be talking about what classes are in this video. To put it simply, classes are just a way to group data and or functionality together. For example, think of a game. In a game, we might want to have some kind of representation of a player. So what kind of things do we need to actually represent a player. We definitely want some kind of data. For example, the position of the player in our game world, certain attributes that the player might possess, such as the speed at which the player moves. We might also want to have some kind of 3D model that represents the player on the screen. All of this data needs to be stored somewhere. We could go ahead and create variables for all this. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at what that would look like. Let's say that we want to make a player here in our code. We might want to have a position, so I'll just say X and Y, and then potentially a speed. Let's just set the speed equal to two. So these are all integers for now. You can probably start to see that this is getting a little bit messy. And in fact, because these names are so generic, you might want to do something like player X, player Y, for the X and Y coordinate of the player, maybe play a speed. And this really does start to get a little bit messy, especially if we decide actually we want two players in our game. Well, then suddenly you're going to have to duplicate this and start doing something like player X zero, player X one. Instead of this, you could of course use an array, but the point is still the same. It's just kind of a bunch of variables that aren't grouped together. They're just unorganized. They're just sitting in our code. And it's just not a good idea. Another great example of why this is annoying is because if I want to write a function that moves the player or something like that, I suddenly need to be specifying all three parameters as integers. So for example, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, the speed, all of this just becomes so much code and so difficult to maintain and follow that it's just, it's really, really messy. So what we can do instead is simplify this by using a class. We can create a class for the player, we can call it player, which contains all of that data that we want, all those variables, kind of in one type. So instead of this, let's create a class called player. We do so by just using the word class and then giving it a name. This has to be a unique name because classes are types. We're basically creating a new variable type. And then we open and close curly brackets as if this was a function. However, note that we do actually need a semicolon at the end of the closing brace. Inside here, we can specify all of those variables that we did below. For example, X and Y for the position and then a speed variable as well. All right, great, so there we go. We've created a brand new class called player, which is essentially its own type. So if we were to start using this player class, we can create it as if it was any other variable. We write the type, so player, and then we give it any name. I'm gonna call this player. And that's it, we've created a new variable called player, which has the type player. And of course, the definition of that type is over here. Variables that are made from class types are called objects and a new object variable is called an instance. So what we've done here is we've instantiated a player object because we've created a new instance of that player type. Now, if we want to set those variables, we can simply write player dot and then the variable name such as X and then assign it equal to something like five. If we try and compile this code right now, we're actually going to get an error that tells us that player cannot access private member declared in class player. This is because of something called visibility. When you create a new class, you have the option to specify how visible the stuff in that class actually is. By default, a class makes everything private, which means that only functions inside that class can actually access those variables. However, we want to be able to access these variables from the main function. So what we actually need to do is come up here and make it public. Public means that we're allowed to access these variables outside of this class, anywhere in our code, really. We'll talk a lot more about visibility in a future video. I don't really wanna get into it right now. So you can see if we compile our code here, then our code compiles successfully. Okay, pretty sweet. So we've achieved our first goal. We've managed to 
drastically clean up the code and have all of our variables in one place. Because really this collection of variables represents a player. So we've managed to group it nicely. Now that we've got all this data, suppose that we actually want our player to do something, for example, move somewhere. So we need to write a function which changes the player's X and Y variables. How can we do that? Well, we could write it as just a standalone function. So I'll write void, I'll call it move. And then I would need to take in the player that I would like to move. But now we'll have to pass this by reference because we'll actually be modifying the player object. And then I'll also take in X, A and Y, A, which will be the amount that we move the player by in both X and Y. Then all I need to do is just say player.x plus equals X, A and player.y plus equals Y, A. We can also use that speed variable that we have there by multiplying our amount by the speed. All right, pretty cool. And if we wanted to call that, we would just write move player and then by how much we want to move the player. So maybe one minus one. And there we go. We've written a function that can move the player. However, we can do a little bit better than this. Earlier, I said that classes can actually contain functionality. So what that basically means is that we can move that move function of ours into the class. And functions inside classes are called methods. So I can literally go over here into my code and just move this a little bit up so that it's inside the player class. And there we go. Now, obviously we're inside the player class now. So we actually have access to these variables. We don't need to pass a player object in because we're already inside a player object. So if I get rid of this, and then all of these, the X and Y and speed that we're referring to will be the current objects variables. If I come down over here, I can change my code now to just say player.move. And there we go, we've simplified our code quite a bit. Every player object is going to have its own move function. And when we call move for that specific player object, that is the player object that will move. Again, this isn't really any different to having the move function outside of the player class. All it does is it kind of cleans up our code and makes everything look a little bit nicer. And that's a huge bonus when you're dealing with a lot of code because the more code you have, the more complicated it can get and the harder it can actually become to maintain that code. So having things like this to keep your code cleaner is actually a very, very welcome thing. So that's it. That is essentially the basics of what classes are. Classes allow us to group variables together into a type and also add functionality to those variables. Because if you take a look at this code one more time, what we've really done is we've just defined three variables that kind of exist in one type and also a function which manipulates those variables. That's really all we've done. Of course, that function can do literally anything, but the gist of it is we've got data and functions to manipulate that data. And that's really all a class is. Now, there are so many uses for classes and we'll kind of start getting into them in the future. This is also literally just the basics of what a class is. There are so many more things we can do with classes, which is why the next few videos are going to be taking a look at those things in more detail. Also, I want you to keep in mind that whilst classes are extremely useful and can keep your code a lot cleaner, they can't do anything that you can't do without classes. Classes don't give you any kind of new functionality that you could not have done otherwise. Anything you can do with classes, you can actually do without classes, which is why languages such as C exist and are perfectly usable languages. They don't have classes and yet we can still write code. Classes are just there to make our lives easier as programmers. They're essentially just syntactic sugar that we can use to organize our code and make it easier to maintain. That's all that they are. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, next time we'll be taking a look at this stuff in more detail and seeing just what we can do with it. Goodbye.